Welcome to the November breakfast and briefing of Four Corners Economic Development. I'm, I'm happy to be standing in front of you today and we've got a great crowd for, for, for information that is always timely, but it's information that you walk away knowing a little bit more about your community. And when you think about healthcare, there's many, many different ways um, about how it affects our daily lives. Certainly the wellness of our people and our, of our workforce and of the region are of the paramount concerns, but there's other drivers as well. Healthcare is a, is a huge business, as you're going to hear this morning. And while I don't want to stand up here in front of you today and, and quote numbers that could take away from the presentations, this is a, a, a big deal for this community. This hospital is in the top 30 uh, in size of the entire of, of companies in the state of New Mexico. So not just of hospitals, but of, of value of companies in the state of New Mexico. It's north of 1,500 employees. So it's a major, major driver for San Juan County for the Four Corners region um, and our everyday lives. I've used this hospital. I've woke up at 1 o'clock in the morning and said, I need help. Since I've been here, and the, this hospital took care of me and put me on a pathway towards health. So I'm very, very appreciative on multiple levels. One of my first meetings I had here as the new CEO of Foresaid was with San Juan Regional Medical Center. And I remember sitting down with the staff and, and hearing about the impacts they make to this region and for individuals, but also for families as an employer. And the number of jobs they have and the type of jobs they have that are open that they're actively filling now since I've been here over the last nine months. So this is a very, very timely topic. It's an important topic for San Juan County and for the Four Corners region. And Forsett is honored to have them here to brief you here today. I've got a list of dignitaries that I'm going to present to you and say thank you for attending this today. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause because it's quite a lengthy list. So that, that's a good thing as well. Um, we have uh, uh, President Pintergrass of San Juan College who has wonderful facilities and I'm very, very grateful for allowing us to use these facilities to bring together together to learn more about our community. We have Mayor Duckett uh, from City of Farmington. We have Jim DeMont that's representing Senator Hendrick's office. We have Terry Fortner, San, San Juan County Commissioner. We have Jack Fortner as well, uh, District Attorney. We have Sam Gonzalez, San Juan County Commissioner. We have the staff with us, which is really important as well, of San Juan Regional Medical Center. We have Board of Directors of Forsaid and our Chairman, Vince Moffat, who is on his way because I think someone may have sent him the wrong address and he went downtown first, okay? <laughs> We have Rob Mays, the city manager, city of Farmington. Mike Stark, the, the county manager for, for San Juan County. Steve Lanier, who's senator-elect. Uh, and we have Sandra uh, Lanier, who's county commissioner-elect. Um, and if I miss anyone, I apologize, because every one of you are important. Uh, and it's great to, to see Vince Moffitt, the, the, the chairperson <laughs> aforesaid, walk in as well. Yes. <laughs> and there's one additional person, uh, Mr. Tom Jackson, who's went out of his way to, to welcome me and I think tell me every story of San Juan County, okay? Uh, and I think he knows most of them, but he helped, he helped write several of them. And I started writing down all the positions that he's held here from being mayor to to uh, being uh, serving us on the state level to being minority leader and everything else as well. But more than anything, he's been a friend. So that's our list of dignitaries that are here and thank you very much for attending. Our first speaker today is Mr. Troy Clark. He's the Mexico Hospital Association. He's the president and CEO and he began that role in August of 2020 after serving as vice president of the regional operation of Presbyterian Healthcare Services. He leads the NMHA in its advocacy efforts with state leaders in the legislators in, in legislative and administrative areas 
with collaborating with hospitals throughout the state in an effort to promote and to improve health of the citizens of New Mexico. In his previous roles, he oversaw the operation of both hospitals and clinics in Socorro, Clovis, I can't pronounce the other one here. I'm still learning all these names in Mexico, okay? Um, Santa Fe, while with Presbyterian. He developed a passion, um, he, he developed his passion uh, for rural communities and hospitals throughout the state in finding ways to sustain their sustainability. He obtained his, his bachelor's and master's degree in accounting from Brigham Young University. He earned his CPA designation and worked in a public accounting for two years before venturing into healthcare. Mr. Clark has 20 years of experience in healthcare in both operational and financial roles. His experience includes opening five new hospitals, working in for-profit, non-profit, and academic environments. It is my pleasure to, uh, to invite to the podium Mr. Troy Clark. Good morning, everyone. Nice to hear a response. I like to have crowd interaction at times. We're going to see how this goes. I usually wander with a microphone around, so uh, I'm tethered. I've got a ball and chain here, but I'll do my best to uh, still present some information here uh, to you today. Uh, and hopefully, I know there's a few of you that were at an event that Jason held uh, with his board uh, about a week ago. Uh, similar, uh, in fact, the same slides, hopefully a little different tone. We're going to talk about things a little differently. Um, as they were trying to set a strategic plan, but really I hope to leave with you today, where are things in healthcare? And there's, this is a point in time where a year ago things were uh, moving in a positive direction and that we're gonna talk about the results of that that have a lot of hope for the healthcare industry, but there's a lot of challenges that we have ahead of us. Uh, so you're gonna hear both sides uh, coming out of my mouth on that one today. Let me start off and just say the hospital association, which I represent, we represent 47 hospitals across the state. It's easier for me to describe who we don't represent. There are federally owned facilities, the Veterans Hospital, the VA Hospital, and the Indian Health Services uh, system. They are owned by the federal government and they really don't interact on state levels. The laws, state laws don't apply to them. Uh, and so they really don't have a need to be part of our association. Outside of that, there are two post-acute facilities, both uh, physical rehab facilities that uh, are not our members. Every other hospital in the state is one of our members. So I put up a uh, map here uh, that I love to talk about to set the tone so we all understand what we're dealing with. I've outlined the state of New Mexico, and I do like uh, audience participation. And so uh, what's unique there about uh, the state of New Mexico compared to the rest of the state when I tell you that each one of those dots represents a hospital. Not as concentrated, it's dispersed. In fact, I don't know if this little pointer will go this far, it won't. Um, so I'll walk over to this one. You see the state of Nevada, there's a big hole in the middle, known as Area 51. I always like to joke and say, if you know anything about that, you need to leave the, uh, you need to leave the presentation. But if you take out Area 51, where we are led to believe that nothing exists, Nevada is the only uh, state that is as dispersed as we are. We have four communities in our state that have more than one hospital. Most of the rest of our hospitals are 50 to 105 miles apart. So when you think about the distances people have to travel, think about the distances of the geography that San Juan Regional Medical Center serves, what happens if San Juan Regional Medical Center were to close? Now that's not a risk, I don't want to scare anyone here uh, right now, but if they were, the distance is you'd have to go, I believe, to Durango, down to Gallup, or it's about equal distance between Santa Fe or Albuquerque, right Jason? Yep. Not a good thing. When you need to, none of us want to go to the hospital, maybe expectant mothers do to end the pregnancy, uh, but other than that, most of us don't ever want to be at the hospital, right? We're there because we have to be. So that leads us uh, into uh, a brief discussion here. So what are the roles of our hospitals? Besides just healthcare, we are an economic driver in every community we're in. Now I wanna dispel one of the myths that's out there that unfortunately our state legislature believes and it's really quite easy to believe because I do the exact same thing when I go through a community and I don't look at healthcare. 
If I drive into a community, a hospital is usually the largest building, employs a lot of people, we just heard 50, over 1,500 people, pays the highest wages in the community on average, and charges a lot for their service. Everybody agree with those four things? Here's the myth. Most people believe A plus B plus C plus D equals they're swimming in money. Easy to believe. If I drive into a town, I'll look to see, you know, I try and figure out what the industry is in that community. Look at the buildings. Who's the biggest building? Who's driving uh, the economy for that community? So I fall victim to the same thing. Unfortunately, healthcare is very expensive, both on what it has to be paid by the uh, patient or their family or their insurance, but also the cost to deliver it. In fact, uh, the harsh reality that we have, and I've got a slide to show you in a bit, our hospitals have been in an upside down position where expenses are greater than revenues. In business, we call that a loss. I have to talk differently when I talk to the legislators. I say we lost money, they say go find it. Okay? During the pandemic, we were in a position that was exacerbated. We don't have that many pandemics that often, where expenses were greater than revenue to the extent that our hospital CEOs had to make a decision. That is not sustainable for the long term. In fact, in our own personal finances, if our expenses exceed our revenue, we only can survive until the savings account is zero, right? If expenses are greater than revenue, you have to have savings or funds from family or somewhere else. It's the same thing for the hospitals. Our hospital CEOs had to look at their cash reserves and make the decision, do I keep services open or do I close services so that my expenses can be reduced? That's not an easy decision to make. Closed services where people can no longer get the care close to their home, as I just showed you the graph of where they would have to go. So the hospital may not close, but we had a number of hospitals that had to make that decision. Are there certain services that I have to close in order to keep this hospital open? Because eventually you have to have revenues that exceed your expenses. And I know people have political beliefs across the spectrum of whether hospitals should be profitable or not, uh, whether there should be for-profit medicine or not-for-profit medicine. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter what the ownership structure is. Every healthcare organization, whether it's a hospital, a doctor, a home health, has to have a margin, a profit, whatever you want to term it. That's how you get reserves to be able to live through those downturns. That's how you have the ability to invest in technology. That's how you have the ability to uh, keep your buildings and equipment up to date. You have to have some level of margin. I don't believe it should be an exorbitant margin, but let me be very clear. Regardless of whether you're for-profit, not-for-profit, state-owned, academic, you have to have a margin to be sustainable long-term, which is absolutely critical for the success of a community. In fact, uh, in our state, one of the biggest drivers that we have that affect the economic viability of our hospitals is the level of Medicaid that we have in our state. During the pandemic, when the federal government expanded the eligibility, we were up to 48% of our state was on Medicaid. Now, after disenrollment, we're about 43.6, I'm gonna call it 44%. Those are big numbers, but let me put this in perspective. The average state in our country is between 13 and 17% of their population on Medicaid. The cost of our workforce has gone up exponentially. Uh, during the pandemic, in order to serve all the demand that we had, all the needs of people to get their health care provided, we had to go out to what they call the traveler market or the contract agency market to say, we have more demand than our hospitals are built for. We have to get the people to care for them, so we have to go pay premiums to bring them in. And when I say premiums, we're talking two and three hundred percent of what an employed uh, healthcare worker would provide. That alone causes tension within the hospital, aside from the uh, financial perspectives. What has this led to? Our large hospitals are overwhelmed. And I'm not talking about the pandemic. We came out of the pandemic, there was a lot of delayed care, 
And for many years, or for a couple years, I shouldn't say many, for two years, people kept talking about our hospitals are busy because of the backup and the backlog of people who did not get care and it got worse and were taking care of them. I'm here to tell you that existed, but that was a very short period of time. We have a reality that we've got about a 20 year problem. We have a generation called the baby boomers. If you look at the demographics of our country and break it out by the different age groups, the group called the baby boomers is about twice the size of any other demographic group. And I got bad news for us. They've hit the retirement age. They're leaving the workforce. And when you have that bolus come through that provides a lot of that care in the healthcare sector and they retire, that's a big loss. But we double that up with the fact that they have now entered the highest healthcare utilization years of their lives. When we're young, we're spry, very few of us need much health care. Unfortunately, these bodies we have near the end of our life, the most recent numbers say you will spend about 80% of the dollars you spend on health care in the last 10 years of your life. We got a problem in front of us. It's not just a New Mexico problem. It's a nationwide problem. <clears throat> I'm not sure, I don't do the research on other countries to know if it's an international problem. If they have a baby boomer generation, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the European countries are in a similar situation. But we have a lot of people who are gonna need a lot of health care, and we have fewer people to deliver it. In fact, right now we've been in a nursing shortage for decades. I've been in New Mexico for about 21 years when I got here. They said we've been in a nursing shortage in New Mexico for at least a decade. So at least three decades, we've been in a nursing shortage. For the last probably four or five years, the uh, workforce uh, committee out of U that's run out of UNM has estimated that our nursing shortage was about 6,200 nurses. The most recent report coming from uh, Department of Workforce Solutions, because we've looked at that 6,200 number and said, you know what, you really are not picking up everything you need. That's not just hospitals, hospitals, doctors, anywhere in healthcare. You're missing a lot. So the Department of Workforce Solutions put together a study and went out and looked at all posted positions. Removed any of the duplicates, because most employers are so desperate for workforce right now, we post in six, eight, nine different places to try and find employees. Removed all the duplicates and came up and said, we are short 8,800 nurses in the state of New Mexico. I want to give you a perspective because, again, big numbers sometimes get washed over. If I take all of the nurses from Presbyterian, Loveless, and UNM, our three largest providers in the state, that's about 6,200 nurses. We are short in the state of New Mexico more nurses than our top three healthcare providers employ. We also have a problem that when we're short, this causes a, uh, the increase that I talked about in demand, especially in our large and urban hospitals. Because in our small rural hospitals, they will take care of those patients they can, but their staffs are small, their services are limited, they have to transfer patients to locations that they have the ability to take care of the resources, the specialists. Right now, UNM Hospital is in its uh, 13th month post-pandemic, that's every one of those months, of being over 125% of capacity. They're running about 132% of capacity this week. They have about 500 beds. So just to make the math easy, when you're 25% over, that means you've got 125 more patients in your hospital than it was built for. 125 patients is bigger than about 17 of the hospitals in our state are built for. That's just the overflow. What does that mean to our rural areas? San Juan Regional Medical Center has a lot of specialties. They are able to keep a lot of their, or a lot of their patients here local, which is great for the patients and their families to be able to get care close to home. But you still have several patients that you have to transfer out. It's not easy to get a, hospital or a patient into UNM or Press or Loveless right now because their beds are not only full, but they're overfull. 
So it becomes a real strain on our healthcare system that now forces us into a position that we have to ship patients out of state. That's not good for family members who want to be there to help provide support for their loved ones, to see them, to take them home when they're ready for discharge, when they're now going to Phoenix or Denver or Dallas. In addition to that, we have a very difficult time and a shortage of paramedics and EMTs in our state. If we can find the bed, we don't have the ability to transport them. In fact, a uh, study about four years ago, uh, five years ago now, looked at our air medical transport, meaning we put a patient on a helicopter or an airplane to get them somewhere. 67% of those transports were not medically justified. And I want to pause and let that sink in because if you don't understand what it costs, one, if you're afraid of heights, you really don't want to be on one of those. But the cost for an air transport, we're talking about if it's in network, if you happen to have the air transport company available at the time you need to be transported and it's in network with your insurance carrier, probably in the $8,000 to $20,000 range. If you are out of network, you're talking about twenty dollars to $45,000 for the transportation because we don't have an ambulance to get you there. And it's not because our ER doctors love the air transport company and just put everybody on an air transport, it's because we don't have the ability to get them anywhere else. If the patient's not well enough for them to discharge and put them in their own vehicle, if they have to have uh, medical attention, that's the only alternative left. That's an extremely horrible waste of resources driven by the fact that we have no other choice. We can't leave those patients for an ER physician to have to treat that he doesn't have the ability, he or she doesn't have the ability to treat. We need to get them where they need to be treated. So what, you're gonna hear a theme there. Workforce is a big focus of what we've gotta focus on. In fact, it's the greatest challenge we have today. We've got provider challenges from nurses, nurse, our nurse practitioners and physicians. Our physician group, our provider group is the oldest in the country on average age. Part of that's not as shocking in the fact that most physicians and providers who practice in rural areas practice beyond 65. They work a little longer than most other parts of the country. Almost every part of our state is what is considered a uh, national health care provi uh, provider shortage area. We don't have anywhere near the number of providers, whether that's in primary care or orthopedics or obstetrics per capita that we would need. We're not just short in providers, we're not just short in nursing. In fact, we're short in every position across the hospital. I would venture to bet, I've not to ask Jason, but he probably has open positions in dietary and maintenance and business office, in insurance verification, in respiratory therapy. It takes an entire team, both clinical and non-clinical, to keep a hospital running. Our physicians found that out during the pandemic, where they may have looked down upon maintenance people in the past. I don't want to say they did, but often that was the uh, stereotype. When they found out they didn't have somebody to repair a bed or somebody to cook the food for a patient, that implicated their ability to help that patient get better. They're all important. Next biggest challenge, medical malpractice. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on medical malpractice, but I will tell you it is a huge issue in our state. This is very unique to New Mexico. Uh, we have a legislature who has decided that uh, medical malpractice caps should be raised from $600,000 to 4 million, went up a half a million each year, and then now at 5 million for any hospital or employed physician. They're at about 880 some thousand for independent physicians. The reason I bring that up, that is not an incentive to come practice medicine in New Mexico. I just told you we're a, we have a provider shortage. We need to be doing things to attract people to come to New Mexico, not to discourage them. And then sustainable Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, is there anyone in this uh, audience who's tried to get an appointment with a physician and got a visit within a week. What are you doing, Jason? <laughs> All right, we got one. 
too. It doesn't happen. And I don't say this from an ego stroke, but I can tell you that I'm probably one of the most connected individuals in this state for people to get access to care. A year and a half or so ago, I had surgery on September 11th. I was supposed to start clinically physical therapy three days after surgery. I couldn't get in until October 31st. Now, if I'm as connected as I am that I can pull strings behind the curtain to try and get in and it takes me seven weeks to get into physical therapy, what does it take for anyone who doesn't have connections? I can tell you. Got a call last week from one of the uh, people I work with. She's a lobbyist for the uh, medical society. Her child has a GI issue, GI issue, gastrointestinal tract. Her pediatrician said you need to get in to be seen ASAP. They got a hold of a, GI, a pediatric GI doctor over at UNM who said I need to see this child within the next 10 days. She had an appointment for February 27th. What's that outlook look for that child? You've got a, I think she's about a year and a half year old. They can't wait six months to be seen. We have a huge access problem. We've got high demand. I've already talked about the baby boomer generation. I usually don't follow my slides and I see that I didn't hear. Um, coupled with, here is the financial position of our hospitals from 2022, right? The end of the pandemic. Every red bar means expenses were greater than revenue. Two thirds of those bars are red. We need every bar to be in the blue so we don't have the risk of losing services from our community. The only bar that's not red or blue is a yellow bar in the middle, shows the average that expenses exceeded revenues by 2.7%. The average across all of our hospitals. There is no uniqueness to whether you're urban or rural, whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit. I have hospitals of all kinds that are in those lost positions in 2022. And yet, you would look and say, Troy, if I go down this street and want to go to the movies, and I see a line at the movie theater, and every night they're sold out day after day after day. That's kind of what the picture I've painted for you with our hospitals, right? They're above volume. And I can't get in to see the movie that I want to see. You would say, that movie owner is making a lot of money. In the state of New Mexico, our Medicaid reimbursement pays below cost. Not below what they charge you, not the bill you get, but below what it costs to provide the care. And I told you we've got about 44% of our patients, I'm sorry, of our population uh, on Medicaid. It means every patient that we see that's on Medicaid, we have expenses that are greater than revenue. We're not in that same position as that movie theater who is just making money because they got more patients they can handle. If you look here, I show the comparison back in 2020. Uh, I kind of covered this earlier of uh, the problem that we've got with our pair mix. You look and see the dark blue, for those who can't read the small letters, that's the commercial business. That's the business for a hospital that has a margin. Revenues are greater than expenses. We can help cover and we can build services, whoops, and provide more care for people. Look how small that bar or that pie uh, slice gets for New Mexico on the right. And how big the Medicaid and Medicare grow. Medicare pays right about cost. In fact, their intent is to pay at cost, but then they exclude a few uh, expenses they won't, they won't allow, and so most hospitals run about 98, 99% of cost. But let's just call them break even. So if you break even on the yellow bar or the yellow slice, and you lose money on the light blue slice, you end up in a position that you have a very few patients that you have to make, it up, up, make up enough money to cover the losses from the Medicaid. Now, I'm not here to uh, scare everyone or make everybody upset, but I think most of us feel like healthcare is too expensive, especially when we look at our insurance premiums. 
the state of New Mexico in 2023, I haven't seen the 2024 numbers yet, had the second highest commercial insurance premium rates in the country, second to Alaska. Now, Alaska makes a lot of sense to me. It's the largest geographic state, has the fewest amount of people in it spread across. Ours is because we have to have rates so high in the commercial side to make up for those losses to keep our physicians and our hospitals open. So now we're going to try and go positive. Now that I got everybody depressed. <laughs> uh, this slide, I'll go over it real quick, just shows the big yellow slice. That's our labor cost. Healthcare is a people business. This shows our uh, challenges that we've got in the workforce, uh, broken out that it's not just the physicians and the nurses, but across all sectors, we have huge uh, vacancies. So what's being done? I don't like somebody who just brings me problems without solutions. We are working on the things that we can. Uh, in order to retain access, you're gonna hear me talk about the Healthcare Delivery and Access Act, HDAA. We got this passed last year to address this problem that I talked about with Medicaid paying below cost. We had an opportunity arise a year ago, April, where the federal government made some changes to the rules of the Medicaid program. I need to step back real quick and do a short high level description so people understand Medicare is for the elderly, 65 and older. Medicaid is for low income. Most people often think Medicaid is a state program. It's run by the state, but it's really a federal program. It started back in the 70s, and the federal government wanted states to have more skin in the game, more engagement. So they said, instead of giving you all the money for Medicaid, we are going to give you money based upon how much state dollars you put in. So we will match those dollars. So every dollar that the state puts up in the state of New Mexico, the match rate varies by state and it's really dependent upon the biggest driver is what your average income level per household is in your state. We're one of the poorer states, we have the second highest match rate. Every dollar that we put in from the state, the federal government gives us $3.72 right now. So we put up a dollar, we end up with $4.72. So with that background, I'm gonna go, they made some changes that said you're no longer limited on the state being able to, what they can pay doctors and hospitals for health care. It used to be capped at what was called the upper payment limit, which was really no more than Medicare. And we as a state didn't even pay that. I told you we paid below Medicare's at cost. Medicaid was about 85 cents on the dollar. The federal government says you can actually pay up to the commercial rate because we need our hospitals and doctors to survive. They also changed some rules on how the states could come up with the money for their portion. The biggest change in that is hospitals could tax themselves to provide those dollars to the state. Now I'm grateful that the governor agreed to accept our proposal and the new program under the new rules, but I also want to be very clear the program I'm about to tell you about is 100% funded by the hospitals in this state. There's a little caveat to that, that there is an old program that we merged into it that there are a few dollars, but I will say that was about $26 million of state money that's been there forever. <coughs> that's led to about $82 million in that program. We folded it in, so we have those same $26 million, but we added to it about $310 million from our hospitals across the state to generate $1.5 billion to come into the healthcare arena in our state. And I believe for San Juan County, we're looking at 50-ish million? 80? 80 million dollars. I'm gonna go back to my comments at the beginning that we're an economic driver. This is a huge economic opportunity for our state. It will help us uh, develop uh, our workforce, be able to invest in additional workforce, be able to uh, invest in the future development of workforce. That has to be our focus. We have to get more kids and more adults interested in healthcare and get them certified or licensed to meet the demands that we have that I talked about as a result of the baby boomer uh, phenomenon that we've got going on. 
So let's talk about it. Uh, I just mentioned this part about the governor signing on board. We actually got it passed with only one no vote between the Senate and the House. Everybody understood, but I think it's pretty easy to understand when I say, hey, legislature and governor, I don't need you to put in any money. I'll put it all in and we'll draw down the federal funds. That's kind of a no-brainer when you say, I, we'll put up a dollar, you don't put up any, and we'll bring $3.72 into the community, which means we'll bring $1.5 billion into this state, which will still be subject to gross receipts tax, so the state will benefit from that. We'll still have another, another a number of other items, premium tax and others, that uh, will be fed by this, but the most important part is our hospitals will become financially sustainable and no longer being driven down by the reimbursement of Medicaid for as long as this program's in existence. I kind of already described uh, how the state law will assess this. The other magic to this, I will say, I spend probably 30% of my time in my position getting my hospital leaders to collaborate together especially in communities where there are multiple hospitals, they're competitors. But they realize they have to work together. And in our state, our urban hospitals had to recognize the demands and needs of our rural facilities to make this work. What do I mean by that? Our urban hospitals pay a greater percentage of the tax than our rural hospitals. That was allowed under the federal rules to qualify for the money. There's a limit, uh, and I don't want to get too technical here, but the federal government says you can't take, even though the hospitals can provide this, they can't give the state any more than 6% of their revenue. That's 6% across the whole state, so our rural hospitals actually pay about 3% of their revenue. The urban hospitals pick up that additional bill so that the rural hospitals end up with more dollars to keep their facilities open. Because on the disbursement side, the federal government requires you to disperse it based on your Medicaid patient volumes. Well, if you think about our small communities, even the ones that someone couldn't uh, pronounce their names earlier, they're not like San Juan Regional. I have hospitals who have an average daily census, which is how many patients do I have overnight on average of two or three. It gets very expensive to keep a hospital open when you're serving two or three patients at a time. Or when you're seeing only 10 or 15 people through your emergency room. But you have to go back to the fact that they may be 100 miles from someone. That's the only health care often provided in those communities. So our larger hospitals end up paying the bigger portion, which leaves our rural hospitals, which San Juan Regional is the largest of our rural hospitals. It still qualifies for, when I say rural, the discounts that we've got to where our rural hospitals end up paying about 19% of the total assessment, but they're getting 41% of the disbursements. What does this really mean for us? Our hospital CEOs, as I've talked about through the pandemic, when you have expenses greater than revenues, you are always looking and having to make the decision of when do I close a service in order to keep some services open for my community. When you flip that equation around and you have revenues that exceed expenses, that allows our CEOs to lift their eyes up, as I say, and look forward and say, what services do our, does my community need that I don't have? That's the positive position that we're in now. We're gonna have $80 million coming into this community that Jason and his team will be able to look and say, what services do we have or do we not have in our community that we can grow and add? That's a whole different outlook. That means some of those patients who are currently being transferred because the services aren't provided, we can bring those services here. That means we can take some of those dollars and we can invest them in the infrastructure so we don't have old buildings and old equipment, but we have some of the newest and latest technology. That means we can take some of those dollars and work with our community colleges to increase the number of class size, or increase the class size across the board to help solve this workforce issue. That means we can take some of those dollars and invest in 
some of the new technology, and I'm really hesitant to say this because I don't think there's a across the board usage, but we're gonna have to rely on AI to augment, not to replace, but to augment our work staff. Help it do some of the men, routine, mundane documentation pieces. Let me talk into a microphone and have it record it in the medical record. I don't want a doctor that's Mr. Robot that's out there. That doesn't, uh, people talk about that. That's not going to happen. But I can have a robot who reads a radiology scan after my, uh, after or before my human radiologist reads it and says, hey, you might have missed something. Or focus on this area make things quicker so that we can process through more. We're gonna to have to use technology to help us through this situation. We cannot train and certify and license enough people to get up to the demand levels that we need in the next 20 years. We're gonna to have to utilize that, but we can't rely on it totally. We're gonna to have to do everything we can. When our small hospitals do well, our large hospitals do well. I'm going to circle back to saying, you know, we've got this overwhelming volume in our urban locations. If our small hospitals can build the services that they have in their communities, they can keep more patients. We don't have to send them into uh, our urban locations. I talked about some of the different things. In fact, I just talked about the education and uh, additional equipment. I'm going to wrap up and say workforce is our issue. We have to focus on getting more people trained to be able to provide the care in all of our communities throughout the state. We now gratefully have this opportunity. Quick update, just so everybody understands, the state legislature passed the HDAA. It then has to go through a process at the federal government to make sure that it's reviewed and approved, that we meet all of their criteria in order to get that $3.72 back for every dollar we put in. They don't just hand it out. We're in the middle of that approval process. It's a timely process that usually takes about seven, eight months. Uh, I'm hopeful that we may get, originally that seven month mark was hit sometime in the month of February. Given the results of the election and knowing that I have a change in administration at the federal level coming, I am very hopeful that we can have it approved before inauguration day so we don't get put on hold and things look good for that. So uh, expectation while I talk about all this and I talk about the hope that it, uh, leaves for us and for Jason, those dollars probably don't flow into our communities until April, May of next year. But then we'll have that opportunity to start looking forward and building towards the future that we've got. And I think that's it, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jason. <coughs> So thank you, Troy. So uh, I'm Jason Rounds, and the President and CEO at San Juan Regional Medical Center. Uh, today, I'm not representing uh, just the hospital. Uh, I'm representing the healthcare community um, for San Juan County and the surrounding area. Um, I'm also here to be a ray of sunshine. So to really kind of uh, shift the focus, whereas our hospital, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it because we're the conduit of this new money that's coming to our community. But I really want to focus on the healthcare industry as an economic driver. It is uh, largely recession resistant. Uh, we've got some new money coming in there, so it's a really great platform for economic development. And that's why I wanted to be here this morning. I first want to recognize my friends from Leadership San Juan, class of 2025. We are aspiring to be, of course, the best class ever. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, advocating for San Juan Regional, but I can't help it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are so you have a context of our organization and how this money is kind of flowing through us. So we, are, uh, rep uh, we support the Four Corners area. We have a large service area that I'll show you in more detail coming up. We are the sole community uh, provider. We benefit from that. If you remember Troy's slide from earlier in that uh, sparse area of New Mexico, we're that one little dot up here in the corner all by ourselves. Uh, we are um, accredited uh, by DNV. That is the organization that makes sure that we are licensed appropriately in supporting our, uh, our Medicare and other federal uh, licensure requirements. Uh, we are a full service hospital. We do um, um, a large amount of services here from emergency services level 
free trauma care to primary care services and everything in between. Uh, we do see that as a critical part of our mission. Uh, our level three trauma status is important to us and the community. We have a full cadre of neurosurgeons that can support you um, and we predominantly provide uh, most of the services. We don't do open hearts. There's some uh, brain procedures that we don't do and we are missing some pediatric subspecialties in our area. But by and large, we are either currently providing or aspiring to provide those levels of care. We are a relatively unique structure. We are a private, not-for-profit organization, um, but we are accountable to a um, corporation. So uh, in San Juan County, there are about 130 or so not-for-profits. Uh, those organizations are eligible to be part of our corporation. About 68 or so of those organizations have joined it. Um, and that is where we draw our board of directors from and who we report uh, back to. So it really does anchor our hospital specifically to this community. We're about this community, for this community, serving this community. Uh, that corporation, as I said, elects our board of directors and that board of directors hires me and then the senior leadership team are responsible for the operations of the hospital. So once again, just at a high level, we're a private not-for-profit, we're 198 licensed beds. Uh, we have just increased the number of ICU licensed beds in the last year, doubling that capacity, trying to respond to the needs of our surrounding community. We're a level three trauma center. We have 128 active medical staff physicians. Uh, we have 210 employed providers as physicians and advanced practice providers, uh, operating it out of 18 clinics in three cities uh, in two states. Uh, and as um, Tim said earlier, we're about 1,700 uh, employees right now, making us in the top 30 largest employers in New Mexico. So our economic influence, we talked a lot about our service area, and this represents that. The gray area is San Juan County. That is the size of Connecticut. There is one hospital in that service area, which is broad, uh, but we support a, a vast area extending into Arizona, Utah, and Colorado as far as our referral sources. Whoops, let me back up real quick. Um, also looking at what's going on in our community is our uh, community is not organically growing, meaning that we're not having additional populations. Our birth rate uh, is less than our death rate. So we are a declining population, population in most of our counties with the exception of Durango and that area. And that is our growth area. So uh, typically from an inpatient standpoint, we have done pretty well over the years. Year after year, we're doing uh, better than 84% of the market share, at least from our inpatient services. Uh, our out migration is predominantly due to services that we don't provide, open heart surgery, uh, pediatric uh, subspecialties, and we do, lo do lose some market to Durango, but probably less than one would think. Uh, from a financial overview standpoint, I wanted to emphasize because you see a lot of my colleagues across the state that are struggling financially. Uh, even before um, the HDAA, we were doing pretty well. So Standards & Poor rates us at a triple B plus. We just went through that evaluation process. The, the two things that are keeping us um, from being an A rated organization are not the stability of our hospital or our financial position, but it's macroeconomic situations of New Mexico and our local area. So not having a diverse economy uh, within that and some of the challenges around malpractice were specifically referenced by Standards & Poor on that rating. But overall, a triple B positive is an absolutely solid rate. It helps us borrow money at competitive rates. It allows us to uh, have access to capital beyond just funding from operations. Our audit opinions over the last several years earned the highest level of assurance, which are unmodified, which means that we're a cred credible, stable organization. As I mentioned, we have uh, 1,700 caregivers. And as my CFO likes to say, we are liquid, we are stable, and we are not for sale. So that's a, a recurring rumor that we hear around uh, the city, but we've got uh, big aspirations. I'm gonna skip over this, but this is really just to demonstrate that we are adding to our um, balance sheet year over year. And we have a, a solid 2025 budget as we are preparing for this new money that's coming in. So even before we're counting the uh, HDAA money, we're about a $400 million in revenue operation uh, supporting this community. So we're expecting the impact for 2025 of the HDAA to be in the tune of about $20 million. 
once again, we're not counting it until it's in our bank account, uh, but we are pretty uh, encouraged that we're gonna see that in the April or May timeframe as it goes through that final approval process. So looking at our current strategic plan, Troy did mention that he was here just last week uh, kicking off our uh, strategic planning session, which we did last Saturday. So um, uh, the great news is, at least um, structurally, we seem to be pointed in a pretty good direction. There wasn't a lot of dissent about what we needed to focus on. What I am struggling with as a CEO is we still have an unending list of those opportunities. Um, and we've got to figure out how to spend that money wisely, uh, focus our resources, uh, and aim for that, and recognize this isn't just a one or two year strategy. We're looking at 10 plus years of development. But if you guys, uh, on our website, we do uh, a community needs assessment once every three years. We just got that finished last year. Our three key areas that we're focused on, which will not surprise you, is access to care. We've got lots of initiatives that are going on around that right now. Our support of diabetic uh, care in our uh, region. We've got some unique partnerships like our San Juan Regional Kidney Care Program. Uh, we've set up our Metabolic and Bariatric Institute, uh, looking at other uh, quality food programs uh, for our region. Uh, and we identified a critical need in our uh, community that uh, we could be doing better with oncology care. Uh, so we have a recruitment plan that we're evolving at this point and really recognizing that our organization uniquely has access to certain um, uh, drugs at a uh, really good rate. So it's a good business decision and a way to actually uh, bring better resources to our community locally. So talking a little bit about uh, what we are doing from an economic development and impact standpoint. So currently we have 38 active recruits going on for physicians and advanced practice providers. So if you think about that a little bit, uh, average comp base salary for a um, entering physician in this market is about a half a million dollars a year. And, comes, and they function like any small business would from an economic development standpoint. So every new resource we're bringing in there is not uh, just bringing in that level of compensation, they're bringing in uh, two and a half to five additional staff members with that from a recruitment standpoint. So that, these are people who are living in our community, buying in our community, building homes in our community and the like. So um, we currently have uh, segmented that. Um, our current specialist gaps uh, is a primary source of our recruitment. Succession planning, uh, Troy mentioned that we have an aging medical staff in New Mexico overall. We do not here. Our average age of our physicians is in, are in their 40s. So we are able to attract a younger uh, group of providers that are going to be in our community, hopefully very, for a very long time. We've also identified um, an opportunity for primary care development and growth, um, as well as those additional specialists that are currently not in our community that we'd like to see here. We also have been uh, working on our recruitment plan, so uh, 38 providers. Uh, without that new development, we have at any given moment anywhere between 70 and 100 open RN positions at our hospital. Over the last year, we have been doing better uh, statistically at retaining our existing workforce, but as Troy mentioned, 8,800 uh, uh, an 8,800 shortage of nurses in, our, uh, in the state overall, and we certainly feel that. Uh, we are investing in uh, partnerships like with San Juan College, looking at how we can work together to increase that enrollment, not only on the RN uh, staff, but also uh, healthcare provider uh, positions uh, across our community. We're also investing um, in teaching. Uh, UNM was here uh, just was, I got last week, time flies. Um, but they have doubled, uh, they're in the process of doubling all of their teaching programs. So that ranges from uh, the nursing programs, PT programs, other caregiver programs, uh, including their uh, medical school programs. Uh, we're focused on uh, doing similar here, uh, but enhancing our ability to be a teaching program at San Juan Regional Medical Center. We already have programs for nurses, advanced practice providers. We've got some medical students, students going on there and we're working on a residency program. So for nurses, we have about 100 nurses students in clinical rotations per year. Uh, we also have a nurse residency program that we're very proud of. Uh, we also have that close partnership with San Juan College that we're working on uh, enhancing as well. 
Medical students, we have a close partnership with Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine from down south. Uh, we have third and fourth year medical students that rotate through our, our area. Uh, we currently have a total of 24, so that's uh, one per class or 12 per class. Um, and our, uh, our regional assistant dean is a member of our medical staff. And for those of you who know Dr. Scoggins, uh, he is that, that contact for us. We're also happy to announce that we're working diligently on establishing a internal medicine residency program. So we were, uh, uh, received a grant from the state of New Mexico to develop this program. It's gonna be a three-year adult primary care postgraduate, postgraduate clinical program. Uh, we're actively developing that curriculum um, and those rotations. Uh, we're hoping to build that to up to eight residents over the three years, so a total of 24. Uh, the first resident we're expected to uh, introduce uh, and welcome to our region in July of 2025. So why are we doing this? It's part of our recruitment and our retention. Uh, if we can grow our own uh, and get them in this community uh, and they can live here, they can uh, really understand how wonderful it is and we hope to keep them in our community. So to sum up, um, we were moving forward. We were an economic force for this community even before the Health uh, Delivery and Access Act. But because of that, we are going to be a conduit for new money coming to our community. And we want to be a, smart about how we're using it. So that's why we're going through our strategic planning session. That's why we're talking with members of the community. That's why I'm in front of you guys talking about this. We want you to be aware of what's going on there and make sure that we are working on that. So our must-haves, which will not surprise you, is the focus on workforce development is key. Our ability to expand and keep doing what we're doing now is uh, it's paramount that we can invest in our workforce to keep what we have as well as grow uh, new folks for that. We're investing in our infrastructure. Um, I, I, like it, I like to call it uh, feed the winning horse, as my old boss used to say. But we've got a number of really outstanding programs here now that needs a uh, little TLC, so to speak. So we'll be investing in new cath labs, uh, new interventional radiology technology, we're looking at the older part of that hospital and making sure that the roof is at, that our fire suppression systems are working um, and that we're doing a little, um, um, some of the, those areas are looking tired, so making sure that they're comfortable uh, and up to date on that. And above all, we are planning for growth. Even before the HDAA Act, we were moving diligently into other markets and looking at where uh, we need to be and where we need to be expanding uh, to support um, our community of Farmington and the surrounding area. So we want to invest wisely. As I said, this is going to have a generational impact. So making sure that uh, we're investing in our workforce appropriately, getting our infrastructure up to snuff so we can really hand this operation uh, that's humming along to the next uh, generation of leaders that come after us. Um, and as I mentioned before, Healthcare is an um, uh, recession-resistant uh, economy uh, by and large. It is also a wonderful foundation for growth and diversification that we hope to be a better partner for this community going forward. But I am going to stop there, and uh, Troy and I are available for, for questions. So he said uh, we should uh, sell popcorn. <laughs> so he said he, he, we should sell uh, popcorn and um, other items for about 20 bucks. I, I have to tell you, when I was in Shreveport, I, I think if we had opened um, uh, and could sell our fried chicken out the back door, we would have had a, a really stable enterprise there. But um, we're, we're going to leave that to other folks and try to invest <laughs> it in our local uh, economy. Um, Jason, I have a question. Um, I have a good friend. She's the RN over at uh, Northern Medical, and she also takes care of Red Mesa. She was telling me that she, she has seen an increase of non-natives going to the hospital. Is that because San Juan Medical can't take them, that they go over there? Um, 
I have not I have not heard that. I know that they have a new commander uh, there that I'm trying to connect with. Um, we take our role in this community very seriously, and that's the whole Four Corners area. And as a referral center uh, that comes there, we want to be um, those organizations' first choice. So uh, we do struggle at times with capacity, as many of the hospitals around uh, the state do. But by and large, um, at least um, recently, as we're tracking, I, I take a look at all of our um, referral logs every day, we've been doing pretty well. So um, we're staffed for the volume. Uh, I didn't look at this morning, but yesterday our average daily census was running still high at 130 plus, uh, which is uh, high for us this time of year. But um, by and large, we're making sure that we're investing in the resources we need to take care of folks. Thank you. Um, most people are obviously celebrating the construction on North but or Butler of, or Pinion Hills of the new private hospital, which generally speaking probably is a nice thing. Could you speak to its impact on the payer mix of these private uh, for profit hospitals and how they potentially could impact our the sustainability of our hospital? Um, sure. Um, uh, and, and Troy, Troy may have, uh, and I keep, I joke with Troy, is like, I, you know, they don't invite me to their strategic planning session, so we're, we're using uh, some best guess. So these organizations are familiar to me. Uh, I've worked certainly in, in markets where they have moved into. So from our standpoint, uh, we have a, a, a broader mission um, that, than they do. So we're here to serve the whole needs of, of the community. We're anticipating that our emergency department will be impacted uh, at the greatest extent, uh, about 15 or 20% of the volume in there, and we're uh, preparing for that. What is important to us uh, is recognizing our role in there that by the description uh, of this new hospital that's coming in there, they will be referring out about uh, 30 or more percent of their patients. So if you go to their um, for emergency care there, uh, about 30% of the time, they're gonna be transferring you to a higher level of care. We wanna make sure that we are that higher level of care and they feel comfortable uh, with that transfer. So working with our county partners on EMS and looking at uh, staffing on that, we've made some modifications to our transport to make sure that we'll be able to transport between that facility and others, uh, or ours, um, as well as uh, just kind of understanding what the needs of that. They, they are a, um, they're an interesting animal. I'm only aware of one other, uh, two other systems in New Mexico that look like them. Uh, they typically do not participate, well, they'll, they'll market that they accept Medicare and all payers, but they are not um, normally active participants in Medicare and, all, uh, um, and others. So their business model works differently. So um, in, a, in a state where uh, we are in desperate need of access to care, it's hard to uh, uh, fault any of them, but we'll, we're going to take our uh, role as a community hospital very seriously in that uh, coming up there. But from a business standpoint, uh, we feel very stable in this community. We kind of understand uh, what they're going to be doing and we are preparing adequately for it. Let me be the outsider from the community and be more blunt. Um, when we're short on access, any additional help is always wanted. Uh, in fact, most of us, uh, when we need care, we'd be willing to pay a little bit more to get it quicker. And I want, I want to emphasize that uh, we have two of these facilities down in the Albuquerque area, and given the access problems we've got in the current term, not a problem. They're there to help and fill a gap that's out there. However, their models are generally structured, as Jason says, if you think about the pie-shaped graph that I gave, to really take that commercial business and charge a higher rate for their services, not taking in the Medicare and Medicaid that reimburses lower. From a long-term perspective, I've got concerns about these models. If we ever do get to the point that we don't have an access to care problem, they will continue to provide upper pressure on the cost. And right now we're in a point where those who have the means are willing to pay a little bit more to get that access to get the care they need uh, locally. So. Long term, do we really want to be driving up the cost of health care higher? I think we got a concern there that uh, we need to be aware of. Is on? Okay, good. Um, my name is Fergie Serum. I came up from Santa Fe. I'm glad I came all the way to see this and hear this. I'm supporting Kathy with the 100% initiative 
And, and the focus that I bring is one that isn't often mentioned and I didn't hear it mentioned today. I saw your map with the dots. I haven't heard anything about telehealth and I haven't heard anything about the opportunity in the short term and mid term to meet both needs. Um, one of the things we know is that the access in this area can be very good. It's better than most of New Mexico because you're close to Colorado. You don't have the same impacts that the rest of the state is facing, but because of the huge native population and the fact that many people don't have electricity and water, telehealth becomes quite a stretch. What do you see as the strategy for both increasing access to services now, but also building up capacity for people to learn what's needed so that they can become your employees? I'm gonna answer that from a statewide perspective. Jason, if you wanna answer. Um, I hope that out of my uh, message, what you got is there is not one silver bullet. There is not one solution. It is gonna take efforts in all ranges. It's gonna take efforts in getting students into the workforce, getting adults into the workforce, us recruiting across the country, us recruiting across the world. Telehealth is absolutely one of the important cogs in that wheel. Telehealth by itself is not the full solution, uh, but we need to have that access. And I'm gonna give one example of something that we're pushing on as the association. Uh, we have a higher, uh, a very high average of maternal mortality in our state compared to the nation. We have a very low uh, participation in prenatal health uh, visits. We believe the answer is not to add more labor and delivery in small rural areas. I shared the hospitals that have average daily census of two and three. If you have 17 or 20 deliveries a year, it does not make sense to put a nurse midwife or a obstetrician in those small rural communities where those providers cannot keep up their skills, where they normally will deliver 120 to 150 babies per year to ask them to deliver 12 to 17 and stay up to speed. The answer is bringing prenatal health care via telehealth to those communities and getting them connected to where they will ultimately deliver their child so they only have to make one long drive instead of many throughout the prenatal process. So telehealth is absolutely an important cog in the wheel uh, that we look at. That's one of the measures that I think is easiest for people to understand. However, there are a lot of limitations with uh, uh, telehealth. There are, as you looked at my graph, I had the large pie chart. Healthcare is a human business for a reason. Uh, some of that we can uh, augment with AI. Some of that we can utilize virtually. Some of it you just have to be hands-on. It's kind of hard to do a surgery remotely. They're working on it to be able to use a robot, but I don't want to be that patient when the doc on the other end of the line trying to operate that robot says, whoops. So um, um, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. So um, we have the same challenges as every other hospital in New Mexico. Um, and being proximate to Colorado is just, it's one of our markets, but also um, trying to address the, the healthcare needs of a four state area. So Arizona Medicaid is a very different animal than New Mexico Med Medicaid, Utah Medicaid, and Colorado Medicaid in dealing with those payers. So there's some interesting challenges. Um, so for, for today, uh, I have to invite you to one of my other sessions. Um, I was really trying to advocate uh, for kind of the economic development and the new money that was coming in there. But from a strategic planning standpoint, telehealth is integ integrated into us. We're using it to a certain level now. It's a tool like AI is a tool. And so it's, it's a question of, are we using it appropriately? Do we need to do more of it? Um, what, what are the best avenues to that? And part of our strategy going forward is to make sure that, one, from an infrastructure standpoint, which we have work to do, um, that our technology uh, from a hardware and software standpoint is where it needs to be. And so we're just now finishing a two-year upgrade to our systems. Our next step is um, looking at our, um, our electronic health record and other integrated technology to say, do, have we chosen the right horse? Are we on that winning horse to go forward? And if it's not, how do we access one that is? So for a hospital my size in this market, uh, the premier program right now is EPIC. It's simply not realistically available to us on uh, a meaning, meaningful way. And so from that, it opens up the concept of, do we partner with folks like UNM? Do we do uh, different leads to kind of leverage that? Or do we come up with a different creative approach and invest in it and become a, a hub for the rural market? 
So strategically, we're really looking at that with the concert of what does healthcare look like in the future? The, the last comment I'll make is we spent a lot of time um, recruiting um, a chief information officer because I come from the philosophy is um, I'm old enough that I've th lived through this as a CEO, the, the greatest thing that we would ever do is let's build a new tower. Um, and we wouldn't hesitate spending a billion dollars on more beds. The, the shift now is making those significant investments uh, to make sure that we are investing in the technology that's gonna engage us with our patients where they are. So I know that I am not smart enough at this stage to figure all that out, but we are at least smart enough to ask that question. Let me add one additional item to that just so you understand that some of the challenges. You heard me mention the uh, challenges we have with medical malpractice. When it comes to telehealth, the medical malpractice laws that apply to any situation are where the patient is located. So the same challenge that medical malpractice causes us to be able to recruit physicians to come here causes us challenge, causes our facilities the challenge to be able to get telehealth providers to want to provide services here. In fact, in many of our uh, communities that are close to borders, and I'm thinking of Las Cruces, there are several providers who will provide telehealth services if the patient will drive to El Paso and get on a, uh, either a phone or a connection in Texas and be able to evidence that they're in Texas so uh, that they can provide that care. So there's a big hurdle uh, around for telehealth providing a large uh, help to our state until we solve that medical malpractice problem. Hi, good morning. Um, my name's Alyssa. I'm with the Farmington Women's Business Center, but I'm also an advocate for missing, murdered indigenous relatives. And one uh, conversation that was going through my head was Megan Kulup, who is from the county, San Juan County, had a business plan that she had um, discussed with me a couple times, and it had a lot to do with like a rehabilitation center campus being put up right there by uh, the Four Corners material right before you get to the casino. So I was curious, um, would San Juan Hospital be designating any type of dollars for that investment? Just because that's something that in the community we see a lot of is alcohol and drug usage. Um, to follow your, your, your pattern of intervention, I think that would be a really good designation of dollars. So um, part, part of the going through our strategic process, as well as kind of tying that back to our community needs assessment, is staying on, on track with that. So for our community, without question, um, when we do that assessment, behavioral health, addiction, medicine, it, it's, it's an unending need. We absolutely have a role in that, um, and we're trying to figure out uh, the, the best use of that. There are a number of uh, programs that we're looking at. We're super excited right now, uh, partnering with the county and the city and PMS and others on expanding um, or developing our, our crisis interventions uh, and treatment center. Uh, from my standpoint as a provider in this community, that service, if, if and when successful, will change the nature of how we deliver behavioral health care and what our need and role should be. So there are a lot of moving pieces in that. I know that we have a role in that. There's a lot of really uh, outstanding ideas there and um, as, as I like to say is we could take every new dollar that we're getting from HDAA and plow it into behavioral health for this region and and not really even solve it or scratch the surface so this is a, a broad community problem and, and we we want to make sure that we're part of the solution as well yeah hi good morning uh, my name's Jens Lang, and my wife and I just moved here last year to retire. And I just wanted to say we were very pleasantly surprised of the San Juan Regional Medical Care. We'd lived the last 20 years in, um, on the western slope of Colorado, Nova Scotia, and outside of Houston. And um, you've, you've been awesome for us. I've gotten two new hips. I brought my father down here from Colorado. He's been to visit you six times, I think, at the emergency room, but, but it, it's worked out really well. So, I, and our primary care physicians at, at the um, clinic in Aztec, and um, if she's busy, we can just go in, um, you know, just to walk in and someone helps us. So you're doing real good. Just one suggestion. I did have to go um, 
to Durango for rheumatology, mm -hmm. and I didn't see that on there. And um, the choices were Gallup, uh, Albuquerque. I had to petition Blue Cross Blue Shield to allow me to go there. They said I could do six visits in a year. Um, I don't know what happens next year, but um, it, a rheumatology would be somewhere to expand. So in, um, um, I didn't bring our, our current recruitment list, but in that bucket of additional specialties we'd like to see in this community, rheumatology is one of them, along with some services like uh, endocrinology and others uh, that we think uh, the community would benefit. But once again, it's just uh, a matter of priorities and what we do. Um, we've been successful recently um, uh, in working on trying to solve our undersupply of uh, GI physicians. And so we are making uh, prog progress on that one. Ho hopefully, uh, we'll be able to announce some, some good um, um, news uh, in the near future. One more question? Yeah, let me get Mike uh, uh, Jim for Perry. Okay. <laughs> I kind of have two. Uh, having grown up in Farmington, the, the, the model was uh, you went to your primary care, you went to a specialty, they went to the hospital, followed you, it now seems like when you go, they don't come. And uh, we see a lot of those in private, pri I don't know what you call them, private or independent, that are losing uh, partners and different ones. Um, and they can't recruit. They, um, and I think the medical malpractice set in place a couple of years ago. People decided to have uh, an exit plan, and then when the compromise came, uh, their exit plan didn't completely go away, and there, there are still a fair number that are looking for an exit plan. What do you see the balance in 10 years from now of those medical people who will be employed by the hospital or its partner organizations versus being able to have a, an independent. And then the second question is, um, I think we all know the elephant in the room is the med medical malpractice. Um, what, you say we're working on it. What, what's in the plan and, and do we even have a receptive uh, state government to it? So I'm going to answer your last question first. The answer is no, there's not a, uh, I refer to a path forward right now. Uh, our most recent election probably made our path forward more difficult uh, to addressing uh, medical malpractice. We have a legislature that is heavily influenced or staffed by trial lawyers. Uh, so when it comes to solving the problem, we have to get legislation through, but you have to create a path forward. So right now our efforts are trying to create that path forward, uh, which is going to take people in our state, our citizens, convincing that they're, they're legislators that there's a problem. And I'll tell you the, the very basic disconnect that has existed is our trial lawyers have been very effective with their peers, with the governor, and with the community to say, Medical malpractice does not have any impact on retention and recruitment. I don't know how they were able to convince something so obvious uh, that the two absolutely are connected. In fact, I say there's a three-legged stool to the problem with our access to care. Medical malpractice, you heard me say these, Medicaid reimbursement, and then our taxing policy. We subject our health care to gross receipts tax. We're one of two states in the nation that subject health care to gross receipts or sales tax. Most states call it sales tax. One of two. We decide not to tax groceries, but we're going to tax health care. I, I don't know that that makes sense, but where that leads down to, I can tell you I ran hospitals. You heard my bio. I've run hospitals for 20 years. I would prefer to have all independent physicians and not have to employ any. But unfortunately, in this state, we employ about 52% of the physicians in the state through our hospitals. Why is that? Because we have to subsidize their income that they can't earn what they would earn elsewhere because of the cost of medical malpractice, because the low reimbursement cost from Medicaid, and because we subject them to uh, gross receipts tax. Between those three, I give you one quick example. In 2017, I tried to, uh, I didn't try, I ended up hiring a pediatrician in Ruidoso, uh, down in the south central part of our state. She wanted to be independent, coming out of residency. At the going rate uh, that year for a new resident pediatrician was $188,000 a year. 
By the time she calculated what she would get reimbursed by Medicaid, what she'd pay for medical malpractice, what she'd pay for her office staff, paying the gross receipts tax, she was looking at earning $46,000 a year. What's my chances of recruiting a pediatrician for $46,000 a year? I hope that gives the picture of what the recruitment challenges are. We are out there messaging right now to come back to the MedMal. It absolutely is connected. You cannot say that we can keep our medical malpractice environment the way it is and have any hope of recruiting additional physicians. Tim, I had, Tim, I had one more uh, item about that discussion point. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner and I understand what you're saying and I've talked to Troy about this. Um, that on a Saturday, I was at a nurse practitioner conference in Santa Fe. And as you know, there were a lot of power outages. So we were sitting in a huge room about this side that was really cold. We were waiting on our Zoom presenter. There was one left and the governor walked in in the middle of the dark to, hand, to give a nurse practitioner week proclamation. In the middle of that, she told us that she is gonna start a nonprofit to address this malpractice uh, concern. So this was just Saturday. She didn't give any of the details, and I don't know what that means, but just like Perry, you know, we've all heard about people that have the exit plans. So I just wanted to put that out there, that that is an ongoing discussion. It's very well known at the top, and uh, hopefully something positive will come out of that. Well, um, and I want to answer the, the first part of your question um, as well. For, for, mal, for malpractice, we are not planning on the, anybody riding over the hill to save us anytime soon. Our brokers are telling us specifically, we're done. We're not underwriting any, we're not writing any new policies in New Mexico because for every dollar of premium, they're, they're spending a dollar 72 in, in, in settlements. So the business model does not work and they're gonna have to uh, address that. Uh, they're also predicting, um, they're saying, we've seen this in other states and we think that a certain percentage of your hospitals are gonna have to go out of business before any reasonable action is gonna be taken. So our responsibility in this market is to make sure that we are certainly not in a position of being one of those hospitals that are at that risk. Our friends in Rehoboth, um, are certainly struggling um, with uh, the judgment uh, and it's are kind of the poster children of, of what that could look like. The other part of it I want to emphasize is San Juan Regional Medical Center, our strategic plan is not to own every private practice in, in this community, but over the course of the last five years, we've gone from about 45 employed uh, physicians and providers to over 210. Um, so I'm grateful that we have a mechanism that is attractive to the, to the provider community as an option, but it is a unbelievable slog for the independent providers that are trying to make a go of it in this community. That's a lot of information, okay? <laughs> as far as Four Corners Economic Development, we're happy that you came here today. These are difficult conversations um, and you, you see the professionalism, you, you see the vision, you see the plan that's going forward for the state and for our regional healthcare uh, system as well. Um, we're happy that each one of you were here to participate in this conversation, and we hope that, that you're better informed on, for your daily businesses and for the direction that moves forward. I'm gonna wrap this up as quickly as possible because we do like the trains to run on time, okay? <laughs> There is optimism that's out there. There are also challenges as well. We're getting ready to start another 60-day session where we're going to have a role in this as well. We're here to support our businesses uh, to help them not just succeed, but to grow and to prosper in this community. This conversation was packed full of, of pivot points that will make a difference today and in the future for our community, for our health care, for our economy. We're happy that each one of you came to participate. I want to say th thank you to both Troy and Jason for sharing with us today. Uh, we will have another uh, breakfast briefing uh, after the first year. And the last note, other than Mr. Taylor, not Mr. Jackson, is we're 43 days from Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs>